I'm Kirsten Wilson. And I'm Christian Haynes. Join us as we explore and embrace the challenges of digital learning. This is Living in Beta Mode. Welcome to the podcast episode number three, season one of Living in Beta Mode. This podcast content is developed by the Digital Learning Unit team and recorded in the Desi Podcast Studios of Donnie Lee. Podcast hosts are myself, Christian Haynes, and the Desi State Coordinator of Digital Learning, Kirsten Wilson. Today, we're going to be talking about the elephant theory. You got me curious, Kirsten. Elephant theory? Yes, Christian. Elephant theory. I don't know if you've ever heard the riddle, how do you need an elephant? Uh, the answer? One bite at a time. I've taken that humorous but true riddle and started to apply it in my own life. I probably started applying it about 13 years ago. You see, when I started integrating technology into my classroom um, and also started exploring how to personalize learning for my students, I tried to do all of the things and all of the good stuff all at once. It really started to overwhelm me, and I noticed that if I wasn't careful, I was likely to burn out. That's interesting. So how did you avoid burnout and how does the elephant theory play into this? Well, what I started to realize is instead of trying to do all of the good things all at once was to pick maybe one or two things per year or per period of time to focus on. That was reasonable and doable for me to learn to do those things really, really well. Application of the elephant theory or one bite at a time, both with my instructional strategies and my integration of technology helped. If the technology integration was purposeful and tied to instructional strategies that I was doing, it turned into one actionable approach done really, really well that cross-pollinated between the instruction and the technology. Instead of trying to eat the elephant all at once when it came to implementing good instructional strategies and purposeful integrated technology, it was to pick that one thing or that one bite and really digest it well and do it well before taking my next bite. So can you give me an example of that? Absolutely. Once I figured out the elephant theory, one of the first things that I tried to do in my classroom was to integrate a technology tool with my students. At the time, it was Padlet. And what I was trying to do was give them an opportunity for voice and choice, as well as a way for me to do a formative check for understanding. What I did was I got really good at Padlet with my kids and how I would implement it as a really effective formative check to meet them by name and need. I use Padlet as a ticket out from a lesson on a regular basis. Are there any things that you had to do to basically scaffold in Padlet or start this process before it was effective? I for sure did. Um, What I did learn is that if you create something that's new to students in regards to any kind of activity for integration of technology tool, Some of the kids are not familiar with it or they're not confident, and that can become a barrier to their learning. So I learned was that I had to integrate it in a fun way that was of high interest but low risk. And again, Kirsten, I have to ask, what would an example of that be? So when I integrated Padlet in the classroom, what I learned was that before I could integrate it tied to high stakes learning, I had to do something fun and low stakes. So what Padlet became for me at first was a morning check where kids could tell me quickly how they were doing and how they were feeling. And if they had any concerns for the day, then they could let me know those things. Then I could check the Padlet to see what the room temperature was for my kids. I also started using it as a ticket out for the entire day to see how things were going. I was a self-contained third grade teacher, so I covered several topics and subjects. The ticket out at the end of the day allowed me to determine how learning went for my kids for the entire day and maybe help me identify where there was a struggle for them or if um, they were left not feeling confident about something. This helped me to know what I needed to address or if I needed to do a quick check the following morning with particular students to go just a little deeper to find out what their struggle might be. From there, I started using Padlet as a way for a ticket out, as I mentioned before. And at the same time, I was figuring out how to use it as a part of my learning process. What do you mean by how to use it or figure out how to use it? Well, what I found was that while I was getting really good at Padlet, my kids were getting tired of Padlet. And so I had to figure out how to use Padlet in different ways to provide variety instead of using it one way. My mistake was that I had the same kind of questions. So what I did to help with this was to find ways to create variety. I utilized different components of Padlet to make it more engaging for them. One of the things that as a ticket out, 
that I did lots of times was to create a short video or what I call shorts that I would post in the Padlet and then ask them to watch the video and respond to it. The video often related to the lesson that I had for that day and they absolutely loved having the video to watch. The way students could respond was another thing that I learned to do. Sometimes it was better to allow them to use images or emojis to respond how they were feeling about things instead of asking them to express it in their own words. I just tried to create variety for them within the Padlet as I incorporated it. I also learned not to use the Padlet several times on a certain day for several different content areas. If I was not cautious, by the end of the day, and for lack of a better word, they were exhausted, which was exhausted and frustrated, and they were done with the use of the Padlet even if the intent and desired outcomes were good. So when I was planning out my lessons for the week, I made sure I didn't use the Padlet more than three times a week with a lesson, and then I also used it in different content areas with them. I like exhaustipated. Is there anything else that you learned from this process? One thing I did learn was that the use of Padlet for a check in the morning and a check out at the very end of the day was probably the thing the kids appreciated the most. I also really got to know my students better through the use of that. They told me some things that before I started using Padlet, they would have never shared with me. What I found was that if I leveraged this digital tool, it actually brought me closer to the students relationship-wise and really developed a strong relationship for us all, which was surprising and exciting and really brought me so much closer to this group of students than I'd ever been before as a classroom teacher. Let's circle back to the elephant theory again. What is it that you want to let educators know about the elephant theory? I think the biggest thing I want everybody to know is that it's not about the quantity of what you do. It's about the quality of what you do. The other part I want people to know is that doing a few things well has a lot bigger impact than trying to do several things all at one time. The other part of it is that you can overwhelm your students if you try too many tools or too many instructional strategies at once, and it can really actually confuse the students rather than enhance their learning. I also follow the elephant theory with goal setting. With goal setting, I encourage those around me that I lead, as well as apply the approach to my own self, that it's really when you're setting goals, you should have no more than two goals, and these two goals that you set whether it be for your personal professional growth plan or for your own personal goal setting, can be a goal that is really big. I call that kind of goal a big, hairy, audacious goal or a BHAG. I have two BHAGs and I'll just share with you my two. They have to do with my role as a state coordinator of digital learning. The first BHAG I have is to ensure that all students throughout the state of Arkansas are masterful in the third literacy. And the third literacy has to do with digital learning in regards to digital literacy, media literacy, and digital citizenship. My second BHAG for the state of Arkansas is to be able to effectively and powerfully connect resources and organizations so that our team, the DLU, can empower teachers to do what they are meant to do for students. Those are some pretty big goals. How is that achieved, or how do you go about reaching those goals? Well, if you want to say so, um, about those being big goals, okay. But um, I've referred to those as big elephants as well. Um, and so when you think about that from the elephant theory standpoint, I take those goals and I look at them like an elephant and then I have to break them down into what I would say actionable bite-sized pieces. I have to break them down to be bite-sized in the same way that I encourage educators when they create their professional growth plans or goals or personal goals or just goals they, that they have for themselves, they create a BHAG, but then they break it down into actionable steps to get there, making it bite-sized. The other thing is that a lot of my goals that I set for myself are not goals that can be met in a year or two years or three years. A lot of my goals I set for myself may take three, five, or 10 years, or maybe even more. Can you give us an example, uh, Kirsten, of a goal that has been over multiple years? One example is that I've had a big, hairy, audacious goal of pursuing my PhD. I have wanted to do that for over 20 years. I also had the intent to get a PhD that was really aligned with where I wanted to go with my education and interests for a long time. And there wasn't a PhD program that really centered on what I was interested in. So I held on to that goal, and every year I searched for Ph.D. programs. 
of course, within that goal, I had the constraints of financial reasonability. And so I had to seek a program that also fit my budget, but also reached my goals of meeting what I wanted in a PhD program. It took me over 20 years to start my PhD from the time that I set that goal, but I patiently waited for until the time was right. Now I'm really excited that I'm doing it within the area that I want to pursue in my PhD and within the financial reasonability that I needed. Also, because the program I'm pursuing fits with what I want to pursue, I'm fully engaged and fully invested in it. That's the same way with other goals. Sometimes you set a goal and there's not really a sure way that you're going to reach it, but you continue to make small bite-sized steps towards that goal until you finally are in a place where you can start to pursue it or make action on it. Goal achievement is much like eating an elephant, and sometimes it takes a long, slow process, and other times it's a very quick process. What I encourage all educators in this is that you just give yourself the space and the time and the ability to know when it's there for you to take on and pick up as a pursuit and when you should just leave it on the table. What do you mean by leaving it on the table? Well, sometimes I think as educators, we take something on that is put before us, and before we think about it, we grab a hold of it, even if it's not something that we really want to have on our plate. There are a lot of things that we have to take on because that's our job and our requirements in our jobs and a part of our roles and responsibilities. But there are times that something is put out there and we feel like we must take it on. But what we don't realize is that when we say yes to something, that means we have to say no to something else. What I think this is akin to in regard to the elephant theory, too, is that sometimes by saying no to certain bites, like we don't want to eat the tail or the trunk, by saying no to the things we really don't need to take on, we're able to say yes to the things that we can take on. So we have a more delectable bite of what we're doing as we consume the elephant of life. With that, what do you want to leave us with? Whatever you do. Wherever you go, remember to embrace life and know that all of us are living in beta mode. Well, thanks, Kirsten. I hope everyone enjoyed this chat as much as I did. In our upcoming episodes, we're going to go deeper with the concept of living in beta mode in regard to the overall tie to digital learning. Our next episode is going to dive into the teaching from mistakes on March 29th. Following that, the next episodes that will follow every two weeks on Tuesdays are Assessing in the Moment, Mindset of Innovation, Origin of Ideas, determination, resilience, and grit, and engaging learners. What are some other things that are going on with the DLU? On the third Thursday of every month, we have what we call Deal Days. Deal stands for Drop Everything and Learn. From 1130 to noon, we have a session where we focus on a tool or a way to support an aspect of digital learning. Past episodes include tips and tricks with social media and the tips and tricks of using Pear Deck. Our next deal day on March 17th, we are focusing on Nearpod. You can go to our new website on the DESI website in the Research and Technology Division section and find information regarding this under Professional Development. There is a registration link there. You can also find our previous deal day recordings on the page and on our YouTube channel. Interested in our support? Reach out to us via email through contactus at ardlu.org. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel you can also follow us on Twitter or Facebook at Digital Ed AR. Thank you for listening to the DESI Digital Learning Unit's third episode of Season 1, Living in Beta Mode. You can catch our next episode, Teaching from Mistakes, set to be released in two weeks on Tuesday, March 29th. Thanks for listening. I'm Kirsten Wilson. And I'm Christian Haynes. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Spreaker, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast catcher. You can also find us by going to the DESI website and searching DESI Podcasts. Other DESI Podcasts we recommend are Smack Talk, Guide for Life, Aware, and 21st CCLC. Thanks again. Thanks again.